years ago, I made the prediction that Corey Bush and Jamal Bowman would not last through the Biden administration. I was correct. And I've already spoken about Jamal Bowman's loss. And now the eyes are on Corey Bush. And I want to get into a couple of factors that played into Corey Bush's uh, loss in this election. Obviously, there is the big giant elephant in the room, which is APAC, which did heavily affect uh, Corey Bush's reelection chances. However, there is information I believe that is being left out. I do not believe that APAC is the only reason that Cori Bush did not win her reelection. There are other factors that are at play. So today I want to discuss the real reasons that Cori Bush did not win reelection. Maybe a little bit different from some of the information that you have heard. So yes, there was a lot of big money that came in from APAC. They pushed uh, a candidate called Wesley Bell. Wesley, originally, from what I understand, he was running for a different position uh, and he was approached by APAC to instead run against Cori Bush. Now, this is similar to what happened to Hill Harper, who was running for Senate uh, in uh, Michigan. Uh, he was also approached by APAC and they were asking him to instead run against Rashida Tlaib. Now, Hill Harper did not take the bait, but Wesley did. So you got to understand this guy seemed to come out of nowhere and all of a sudden he was able to beat her. APAC is a big problem. We need to get into it. Corey Bush had a response here and a lot of people are giving her flack for this response. Listen to this. Take me away from my position as congresswoman all you did was take some of the strings off let's be clear 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 Let's be clear. Let's talk about what it really is. Because see, now I don't have to worry about some strings that I have attached and as much as I love my job. But all they did was radicalize me and so now they need to be afraid. Now, this is the activist part of Cori Bush. You have to remember that she does come from activism. Uh, she was a part of the Ferguson protest, and that's where her name be became more so known, uh, I would say. Uh, and then she decided to run for office. I honestly believe that Cori Bush was better as an activist. I think that if she wanted to go into politics, she would probably do better on the local level just because of the powers that be in DC, the corporations, in the military industrial complex, all of these issues that all of the, the politicians have to pretty much deal with in DC. Uh, but I just think about the ways that she could have been even more effective and she could have gotten more done if she were to remain a local politician instead of uh, going to D.C. Uh, but she was an activist, and I feel like this is where she was at her strongest. Um, it's really sad when you look back on it, because I remember uh, there were Medicare for All marches in 50 states all across this country. I participated in those marches. I was an MC for the march here in Boston. And I remember that Cori Bush was the only member of the squad to appear at one of the marches. She appeared at the one in DC. Now I say that, but I have to add this part as well. She appeared there, but she also made it known to other activists that her and the squad did not agree with what we were doing, that they did not approve of us having those Medicare for all marches. And that was when I started to realize, yeah, they got to Corey too. They got to her too, right? So this idea of being a one-term congressperson, fighting back against the system, once those squad members got into office, that started to change. C 
see, now they about to see this other Corey, this other side. Cause I, cause let me say this. I just grew up a whole lot more over the last few weeks. Just grew up a whole different way. And so what they are about to get, they think. So the, the, the thing is this, the thing is this, I don't, I don't think that anything, there is nothing that happens in my life that happens in vain. So if this happened, it's because it was meant to happen. And let me say, it's because of the work that I need to do. And let me say this. I'm coming to tear your kingdom down. Now, apparently there are a number of people that had a problem with that statement that she made there. They are calling her anti-Semitic because she says she wants to tear down uh, APAC. Obviously something that would be more difficult to do if you are a member of Congress versus if you are outside of that system. This is why when people say to me that, oh, Sabby, I would love to see you run for office. No, because the reality is as an activist, there's more that I can do on the ground. There's more than I can do in reference to organizing than to become a, a typical politician. The reality is once you go into those halls of Congress, especially if you're a part of the two party system, if you don't get in line, they will remove you. That's what they did to Cynthia McKinney. That's what they did to Dennis Kucinich. So we always have to remember this lesson. Do I think that APAC does need to be torn down? Absolutely. APAC should have to register as a foreign agent. This is something that JFK wanted to do. And then he was killed. So think about that for a second. JFK wanted APAC. It was a different name at that point in time, but he wanted this organization to register as a foreign agent because they are not acting on behalf of Americans. They're not acting on behalf of American interests. They are acting on behalf of Israel. And if you're one of those people and you say that you are America first, you can't do both. You can't be America first and Israel first. You just can't. I don't care what anyone says. You care about people in this country first or you don't at all. So she received a lot of pushback for that comment, in particular from the White House press secretary. And I just got it, you know, Corinne Jean-Pierre, she's probably one of the most notorious liars all the press secretaries are. If When it wasn't her, it was Jen Psaki. When it wasn't Jen Psaki, it was Sarah, San Sarah Huckabee Sanders. It was her too. The, all these people do is stand in front of a podium and lie to the press. Their job is to protect the president, to protect that administration. So I want you to hear what Corinne Jean-Pierre said about Cori Bush making the statement that she wants to tear down APAC. Listen to this. Cori Bush, she gave a speech last night uh, after the results came in and she said, to APAC who spent heavily against her, I'm coming to tear your kingdom down. Does the president have an opinion on that statement? So look, the president has always been very clear and very recently after uh, the assassination attempt of the last president about lowering rhetoric, right? Lowering political rhetoric and the importance of doing that. Uh, it is important, important that we uh, be very mindful of what we say. Uh, this kind of rhetoric is inflammatory and divisive pause right there for a second. So I want to show you the hypocrisy, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Congress just allowed Benjamin Netanyahu to waltz into the house and give some of the most divisive, dividing rhetoric that I have seen. Racist rhetoric, demonizing Palestinian people, demonizing American protesters. This guy walked in and acted like he owned the place. But there was no remark after that from Corinne Jean-Pierre, from the Biden administration, talking about the divisiveness of Benjamin Netanyahu's rhetoric. This is what you have to pay attention to. Everybody else is divisive except for Israel. There are literally right now, right now, there's video footage. There are articles of Palestinians being sexually assaulted 
in the Palestinian detention center in Israel. And not one of these corporate media pundits has addressed the issue or acknowledged the issue. But when there were the accusations about sexual assault on October 7th towards Israelis, when they had no evidence, they still have no evidence. And it has been debunked multiple times by multiple outlets. All of those corporate media pundits took that opportunity, jumped right on it and said, this is uncalled for and despicable and disgusting. Dana Bash spent segment after segment calling out something that she had no evidence for whatsoever. But there is actual video footage that shows that this is happening to Palestinians that are detained in the Palestinian detention center. And no word from Dana Bash, no word from the Biden administration, no word from Kamala Harris, no word from Donald Trump. The only people who are talking about this are the candidates that are running out outside of the duopoly. It's Jill Stein. It's Claudia De La Cruz. It's Dr. Cornell West, not RFK Jr. because he's also on the pro-Israel side. So pay attention to what is happening here, folks. It's always divisive when you are criticizing something that has to deal with the state of Israel. Big money interests should not be a part of electoral politics in this country. But it is. And so that's considered divisive is considered divisive to tear down an organization that basically should be registered as a foreign agent It's divisive to tear down an organization that is putting up big money. And they're mainly going after black candidates. FYI, I have my criticisms of Cori Bush, but let's be clear what's happening. They're mainly going after the black candidates, the black politicians. The hypocrisy knows no bounds. And incredibly unhelpful. Uh, and uh, look, we're going to continue to condemn any type of political rhetoric in that way, in that vein. And so it is important to be mindful in what we say and how we say it. Uh, but uh, we cannot have this type of inflammatory, div divisive uh, language in our uh, political discourse. But Netanyahu did just that, okay? So Corinne Jean-Pierre, again, she's a paid puppet. She's just supposed to repeat the State Department talking points. That is why you see her uh, trying to make some type of defense for APAC. So APAC is a, is a huge problem. It's not just APAC. Big Pharma is a big problem. We have to call out all of the big money interests that is controlling these politicians. And that is why it was very disturbing to me that a number of people who were on board with not supporting corporate candidates or candidates that take corporate money now all of a sudden are totally fine with getting on board with Kamala Harris because they just want to stop Donald Trump. I want people to be very clear about what's happening here. Where does just stop Donald Trump get you if you don't get anything in return? People are just voting on vibes, very problematic. So APAC, yes, is a problem. And it does need to be removed from our electoral system in this country. But now I wanna talk about something that may be a little bit more uncomfortable for those who don't want to acknowledge this reality. APAC was a big reason why Cori Bush lost re-election, but it is not the only reason. And I wanna focus on the local issue. Now, I am no fan of this Wesley Bell character. It is very clear to me that this guy is just another paid puppet. You're running for one race, APAC pays you money, you're able to just, oh, okay, yeah, I'll just take the money. So Wesley Bell has already showed you that he can be bought. So there's that. But there's something that he said in his interview with CNN that did give me pause. Let's go ahead and get into this clip here. Another reason why Cori Bush did not win re-election and people really need to hear this. And Wesley Bell uh, is joining us now. Uh, Mr. Bell, thank you for joining us after your big night. I, I should mention you are favored for the general election. And uh, of note in this race, the issues really didn't come down to Gaza, Israel, but the money sure did. Progressives, of course, usually askew that kind of outside money. So as a self-described progressive, how are you reflecting on your win considering that? So notice how all of a sudden he's a progressive 
Notice how the term progressive has been watered down. Progressive except for Palestine, right? So everybody see this now? Anyone can just call themselves a progressive. Progressives do not take corporate money. Well, you know, first of all, I want to thank all of the supporters and staffers and just so many folks uh, that got us through the finish line. But this race on the ground wasn't about who was funding who and negative ads. This race was about the the issues that matter to the folks right here in this district. And pause. Everyone look at these numbers and pay attention to what he's saying about the issues that matter to people in the district. Look at the numbers. Wesley Bell, 51.2%. Corey Bush, 45.6%. So it's not like this was a close race. And yes, uh, the money on the ground does matter. He's pretending like it doesn't. It does. When you have more money and you can put out more negative ads, yes, that does have an impact. He's lying when he tells you that it doesn't. But the other part that he is mentioning here, when he says that it's about the issues on the ground, listen to it. I sat on polls all day and in the hottest day of the year, I might add, um, and folks were continually coming to me and saying, hey, I saw the ads, I, whatever. We want to know what you're going to do for us. And as the former. So notice how he uh, double talks there, right? So he told you it's not about the big money, the money that was spent that didn't have an impact, right? But then he tells you that the people came up to him and said they saw the ads. <laughs> For Ferguson City Councilman as the current St. Louis County DA. Um, folks around here know what they're going to get from me. They know I'm going to show up. They know I'm going to represent the interests of this district. And that's ultimately what brought this win home for us. So what what issue then do you think it really came down to between you and the Congresswoman? You know, I think it's about priorities and um, um, I think that her priorities seem to be more about things that um, outside of this district, as opposed to things that matter to folks that matter to folks in this district. Um, um, we have, um, you know, we have really serious issues here. The number one killer of young black boys in this district is gun violence, and that's not okay with me. We have to uh, push for common sense gun safety laws. In Missouri, we have the most archaic um, abortion laws in the state. Women have absolutely no autonomy over their body, and it's important that we codify Roe versus Wade. Um, we have health care and food deserts in this region. This region has been dying a slow death, losing population around the metropolitan area, and those are the things that matter to everyday folks in this region. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about there because I didn't just hear this from him. I've also heard this from other people that are in that area. So I want to push back on something. I want to disagree with him when he says uh, the women's rights issue because Corey has been very vocal about that. So I don't agree with him about the women's rights issue. But the point that I want to drive home is that the other reason that Corey Bush lost is because of the local issues at hand. This was the warning that I gave to Jose Vega, who is running as an independent against Richie Torres. I firmly believe that if Jose Vega has a strong, you know, local policy platform, he could actually probably beat someone like Richie Torres because Richie is not helping people in that district. But when I interviewed him at that time, it seemed like most of the focus was on foreign policy. And I heavily talk about foreign policy on this channel, but I also focus on domestic issues. Also, I'm not a politician. And I think that when you're running for office, you really have to focus on issues that hit at home. Still focus, you can still cover foreign policy and put your position out about that. I still think that's important, but you, you have to have a local platform. You can't just not focus on the local at all. So it became a very, very apparent to me that one of the reasons why Corey Bush lost is because there seemed to be some type of neglect with the local issues. The constituents somehow feel that she was not focused on what was happening at home in her district in Missouri. Why is that important? Because when you vote for someone for Congress, they do represent your district. So people wanna know what you are going to do for them. 
And I can point to other examples to talk about this. For example, Ayanna Presley, another squad member. I used to live in her district when she ran the first time. I voted for Ayanna Presley. Ayanna Presley is one that I will say tends to be a little uh, to the right of other squad members. But when it comes to local issues, Ayanna Presley tends to be pretty present. And people may not always agree with her position, what she's she's supporting locally. For example, affordable housing, which they're not really affordable housing units that are affordable to people in the area. So they may not always agree, but she's present. People see her, right? She attends multiple events, speaking engagements, like that type of thing. She was pretty active within the community. She was a city councilor before she was a congresswoman. So there were a number of things that she accomplished locally as a city councilor before she went into Congress. So one of the things that I really want people to get and understand, it is important that you take care of your district. It is important that you are paying attention to what is happening locally. Yes, there are national issues and international issues that you have to deal with as well as a congressperson. But if your constituents start to feel like you're not paying enough attention to the issues that are happening at home, they will start to look elsewhere. I would argue even without the APAC money, he probably would have won because of that issue right there alone. This is why I continue to focus on ballot initiatives. If you're new to my channel, I know a lot of you are new. If you're new to my channel, if you look on the homepage, you'll see there's an entire section for ballot initiatives. I'm covering this often, right? We're about to get into the 2024 ballot measures, which I will start covering on Friday because I want people to realize that there are things happening locally that you need to pay attention to because it's going to affect you directly. I want people to realize that there is some type of power that you can have there at the local level. I want people to realize that when you complain about policing, when you complain about the public school system, these are local issues. So it's important that you understand how these these uh, issues affect the district as a whole, but also as the state. That's why it's important that you know who your city councilors are. You need to know the mayor. You need to know who the governors are. And a lot of people don't pay enough attention to that. They're mainly focused on the political landscape on the national level, who's running for president. And while you're so focused on that, you can easily miss the other factors that are happening locally on the ground. So He's not the only one that has said this. I've heard this from other people, again, that live in the area, that they felt like she was not present with the local issues. He said the number one issue that they feel is gun violence. So we have to talk about that as well, because remember, Corey supports defunding the police. She was part of the Ferguson, you know, protest, that kind of thing. And I've noticed over time, and I still support defund the police, but over time, people are starting to move away from it, right? And focusing more on gun violence at hand. So if the people in the district feel that she was not present for those local issues, that also is a factor in this loss. And we, we can't just blame it on APAC. Big part of it, but it's not the only reason. I want to show you something. People were asking me, why is it that APAC didn't attack AOC? Well, you have to remember that AOC hosted the anti-Semitism webinar, uh, which ultimately is part of the reason uh, why DSA decided not to endorse her, to remove their endorsement uh, because she conflated anti-Zionism uh, with anti-Semitism. But that's a whole other story that I've already covered. But the reason why her constituents continue to vote for her is because she's doing things like this. James Medlock said AOC on IG Live showing all the backpacks stocked with school supplies that her campaign is giving out to kids in her district. And he said, love this. So you can see the picture here. Here's AOC with all like the book bags and all that kind of stuff. So one thing I will say is this, is I have a lot of criticism of AOC because she has found ways to like sell out working class people on a national level. And she's definitely became a career politician, right? And she's made some votes on foreign policy that have been bad, didn't want to force the vote for Medicare for all, et cetera. So she's a political careerist at this point. That being said, 
I always applaud mutual aid and AOC is doing mutual aid. This is not the first time I've seen this where she is organizing, helping people in her district. So as a politician, if you are taking care of your people, you're taking care of your constituents, then they will in turn come out and support you. And I don't know if Cori Bush is doing any type of mutual aid. Uh, maybe she is, maybe she isn't. I have not seen that. This is not what I'm hearing from people that again, live in the area, but this just goes to show you again, when you take care of your people, they will come in turn and take care of you. Now, that being said, there's another piece to this puzzle that I also think needs attention as to why this election went the way that it went. I want you to focus on uh, the turnout. We're going to go back to the first one for Cori Bush here against uh, Clay when she won in 2020. So remember, this was a politician. I think he had been in office for like, I forget, over 20 years or something like that. Like he'd been there for a long time. But I want to show you something. We need to look at the voter turnout. This oftentimes is not mentioned, is voter turnout. In that election that Cori Bush won, she received 48.5% and William Lacey 45.6%. Then of course, Catherine Bruckner 5.9. But this is the part that people oftentimes don't focus on. The total number of votes in that particular election, over 150,000 people showed up to vote. Okay, interesting, right? Now let's fast forward. Let's go forward here a little bit. Now we're gonna go to 2024. So I want to show you the difference. We're just gonna scroll down here to the turnout and I'll actually make this a little bit bigger because I really want to harp on this for a second. In the 2024 race for Corey Bush, Wesley Bell received 51.2%, she received 45.6%. Uh, Maria received 2.6 and Ron received 0.6. Again, look at the total. These are things people don't really focus on. Over 123,000 people voted. So we're talking about in 2020, 151,000 compared to 2024, 123,000. That's almost a difference of 30,000 votes. And the reason why I wanted to show you that is because it is very apparent to me that something else is going on here. I've noticed this across the board. It's not just Missouri. AOC also has received fewer votes uh, in this 2024 election compared to previous ones. Across the country, there is a decrease in voter turnout. And this also can affect the race. And I don't hear enough people talking about this. It's easy to just point to those numbers and say, this person won, this person lost. But I have been tracking voter turnout over the past three years since I started the show in 2021. And I'm noticing that the voter turnout is decreasing over time. Now, why is that? People are less enthusiastic to come out and support any of these candidates. People are noticing that these politicians are not helping them on a material level. When they look at their wallet, when they look at the economy, when they look at the grocery store prices, the turnout is decreasing over time. I just noticed this the other day where people were pointing out uh, the rally in Wisconsin for Kamala Harris, which there were a lot of people there. But at the same time, some of them, they said they were there just to see uh, one of the, the musicians that was performing. But when I compare those crowds to Bernie Sanders crowds from 2020 and 2016, it doesn't even hold a candle. So ultimately what has happened is that masses of people that supported uh, progressive policies and had hope and faith that these things were going to turn around for them in this country, they've started to check out because they realize that the so-called progressives that went into DC just decided to go along with Democrat leadership and not push back in areas where they really and clearly should have. So when you have 
a, a voter turnout that is continuing to decrease over time. That is a message from the voter base. That's a message from the American people that they do not feel that it is worth their time to come out and support you because you have not produced any tangible improvements in their life. The economy has been in a mess. A number of people have been laid off. It's a disaster. So I know we're seeing a lot of polls now, even when we look at the presidential election, but the reality is we don't know what that turnout is going to be until it actually happens.